chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Uh, be honest in looking at this. It, it's been, as it always is when you, you come to the end of a, of a study, it's, it's an exhilarating time. You've gotten through it, but at the same time, it's, uh, you've gotten through it. But if we look there, we find James chapter 5, looking at verses 19 and 20. The Word of God says, Brethren, if any among if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you, Father, I just simply ask that you would be with us right here, right now. Father, I ask that you would just open up our hearts, our minds, our souls, and hear your word. Help us to know that this word is true. Help us to see the, the application of what it is that we are called to do. And Father, let us just praise your name. For it's your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. All right, so look in there, in looking at this wandering from the truth. Now, as we look at that, we find that the word there, wandering, is the word uh, planeo, meaning to roam. Uh, guarantee it's sort of like uh, Brother Keith's uh, dogs outside whenever nobody's around and they don't want to sit around. They're going to do what? They're going to roam a little bit around the farm or uh, you look at sheep that uh, go astray or cattle, whatever the course may be. As they roam, they go astray. But we look at this a little bit more and we find a little a bit of something that, that puts it more into today's context. Uh, when we see it means to wonder, but it's not deliberate. See, we have that a lot of times and a lot of people... Uh, that they don't mean uh, to begin to wonder. They don't mean to get into uh, a bunch of sin. Uh, for some of us, it just happens. We, we talked about a little bit ago uh, and talking about a, a young uh, woman in our own community and uh, how uh, knew not to do, knew what to do, but seemingly did what they wanted to anyway. They wondered uh, from the truth. Now, with that, we find uh, that this is goes with, uh, and we, we really got to see this, this word wonder means it's a backslidden state of the Christian in context, not of the law. So we, we've been looking at, Brother James has been looking at, hammering out over and over these things, and these very last words he is saying uh, to those within the church when there's somebody that goes a-missing. When you've got the, the MIA Christian, they're missing in action. Uh, they've, got in, they've gotten into some wandering, some sin. They've fallen short. And all of a sudden, we all have been there, or if you haven't, you will be there, where all of a sudden you become ashamed of even where you're at. Here we find that that is where Brother James is saying that if anyone among you wanders from the truth, someone has to turn him back. Now we can look at the truth and what does it mean? It literally means uh, uh, truth of gospel doctrine. Sometimes we can, uh, we can fall into some strange genealogy or some strange doctrine or we can... Uh, put one thing over another, and uh, it could be, well, uh, some within the Christian community uh, put everything on tongues, where others in the Christian community uh, will put everything in on calling, and whatever the course may be. But we need to understand that it's not that we are falling away from God himself, but a lot of times it's a fact that we are wandering from the doctrine in which we became saved. It means to, uh, to wander from the truth of the gospel precepts. You know, there are certain things that a Christian must do. Uh, and it's not the list. Now, it's not that I don't drink, smoke, or chew, 
or date girls that do. But what it is, it is the very fact of uh, we are to study to show ourselves approved. We are to continue to pray daily. We are, as the Bible says, pray without ceasing. Uh, we are to not fail to assemble ourselves together. Uh, there are all these ones that show the precepts, but the most important of all of these are that we follow our Lord Jesus Christ and the orthodox of religion. It also can be of the gospel in the abiding. Abiding in the Word of God, but also in the Spirit of God. Sometimes we can be in church three, four, five times a week and still not be any closer to God than if we were sitting at our uh, kitchen table with nothing going on. When we we see people that grow cold and indifferent as they that they come in and they go through the motions, they know what to do, but yet at the same time they just don't totally buy into the things of God. Those are ones that are roaming too or wandering too. But here we find that Brother James says, if anyone among you is wonder uh, wonders from the truth and someone turns him back. So as we look at that someone, this is where we find uh, one and back. That, that's where we find this, that it's not somebody that's lost, but it's somebody that has wandered from the faith. It is someone that has backslidden. Uh, but as we look at that, we find, I'm going to take you over real quickly to Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, we're going to look at verses 1 through 5, if I can get there, and a decent amount of time. And there we find that the Word of God says, And the Word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus saith the, the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat fat and clothe yourselves with wool, and you slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak have not uh, strengthened, nor have you healed those which are sick, nor bound the broken, nor uh, brought back what was driven away nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. You see, as we look there, we find in Ezekiel, the Lord is giving a call to us to go out and not only reach the lost, but to bring those back in that have went wayward. I guarantee you right now, if each and every one of us were honest, we all took a, a drip of uh, truth serum, we know somebody that reaches that point. As we find Paul says in uh, Hebrews chapter 6, uh, for those who have once tasted and have been enlightened by the word of God. Who was that in your life that you know that you know that they're a child of God, but yet that they are not living the life that God has called them. And then the next question you've got to ask is, why are you not doing something about it? He says here once again, uh, and someone turns him back. So how do we do that? Very good question, uh, Brother John, that... Uh, how am I supposed to reach that situation and try to reach out to them? Well, uh, first off, it happens in our confronting the sin. As Christians, we are to hate the sin, but love the sinner. Now, that does not mean that we must compromise on what sin is. But what that means is we call sin, sin. If someone is in sin, 
we must tell them in a loving way. I believe that I believe one of those things is uh, speak the truth in love, not hate. But honestly, and this should be convicting, when we don't confront the sin, we are really hating the sinner. When we are not willing to go to them and say, you are wrong in what you are doing, that's really a sign of hate for that person. Instead of following your Lord Jesus Christ, you are following yourself, and therefore you have another Christ, which is yourself, and in so you begin to err. We are to be instruments in the turning of sinners from their error and all their way. And here's the thing that, that a lot of us have a problem with. And that is this simple fact, that sometimes that can take a while to do. We, as a uh, microwave society, want to go there, give them a truth bomb, and walk away, and they better get it right. That's not the way it happens in a lot of cases. If you'll remember when we went through Share Jesus Without Fear, uh, uh, one of the statistics, and this was back in the the 90s, this statistic was that it took at least six and a half times. Now we're 30 years into the future. How many more times is that going to take? And here's another thing that we need to understand as we're trying to turn them back. Sometimes there will be failures. Sometimes we or they may slip up. Does that mean we give up? Or does that mean we continue to work on them? When we do this, what we are really doing is we are bringing the glory to Christ. You'll go back in your Bible, you can read the uh, the Great Commission, and he says, go out and tell everybody, right? And he, we look at that in one of those words, in teaching, that, that means to disciple. See, when we are doing what Christ has called us to do, we are glorifying him first in the fact that he is transforming us. Because how many people like to have conflict? So he's got to transform us to do his will. But then it's in transforming them as they become closer unto the Lord. We do this through discipleship, really. Uh, and it's not one of those things of give them a truth bomb and then walk away. But it's something, this discipleship, literally the word means to come alongside somebody and to work with them and to help them along the path. Well, preacher, I don't have time for that. Yes, yes, you should. Yes, you do. Because in this uh, discipleship, we'll find that there they will receive restoration. I want to look at something real fast with you. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, and there it says, Brother, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are, who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, there's that discipleship, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks of himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. So, so what do we find there? That number one, you find there that we are to examine ourselves, but then we are to help our brother, our sister, and need. 
I'm afraid in the Christian world we live in today that we are too quick to throw them away. We treat them as disposable friends. We treat them as disposable people instead of looking to restore them to where they need to be. But ultimately, we do this through Christ himself. Not through what we can do, not through what uh, they have done, but what Christ himself has done for us. In this, we find not only reconciliation, but we find uh, this restoration as well. If you'll remember, Matthew 18 says there, if you have an all with a brother, uh, take out the two by four and beat them, right? Oh, no, no that, that's not there. But that's what we like to do. You go to them, and you try to help them see the way it's supposed to be. But we do this also through our prayers. I want to ask a simple question. How long has it been since you've prayed for either a wayward person who's in sin or for the sinner themselves? Well, preacher, I prayed just a few minutes ago. Well, great. But was that, was that prayer with tears? Was that prayer one that was really meaningful, or was it simply words? Because as we do this, as we get ready for this, we must understand that it comes through prayers, it comes through tears, it comes through entreating unto God, praying unto God that, that He will do in them what needs to be done. says there, unless uh, uh, if someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from their error of his way shall save a soul from death. When we look at that word him, what he's really talking about is the converted Christian. Now, if we look out in this world, we can see a lot of people that think that they can see everybody else's sin, but what's the hardest one to see? Our own sin. We can see what's wrong with such and such, but seeing it in herself becomes a problem. Jesus talks about that on the Sermon on the Mount, if you didn't know, uh, where he says, uh, Why are you worried about the beam in his or why are you worried about the speck in his eye when you got a beam in your own? A lot of times we need self reflection. Crying out to God, Father, show me where I need to be better. We find with this, he says there, that they will save a soul from death. Now, now, as you look at this, uh, you need to understand what he's talking about. If you really look at the, uh, the Greek behind this, when he says, he says, we'll save. That means it's a salvation also of the future. Now, preacher, I, I, you can't make a, a horse drink. Well, no, you can't. But if you bring them there where they need to be, if they're thirsty enough, guess what's eventually going to happen? They're going to drink. It's a future in that salvation. It's also literally just means to save. That word there is sozo. It means to deliver, to save them from everything hereafter. In this restoration business, I want to take you really quickly over to uh, Romans chapter 11. And there we find that the Word of God says, Romans chapter 11 Verses 14 and 15. For it, uh, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those which are my flesh, saving some of them. For if their being cast away is reconciling of the world, that will their acceptance be put, uh, be but life from the dead. So what do we find there? We find that in this restoration it happens through the exchanging one from another. In other words, we have to have an exchange. We have to 
help them see where they're wrong. We need to help them see where they need Christ. We need to help them to go forth and do these things. And then we find that it's simply by the very grace of God. Now, this is where I will say uh, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. You can grab a bull by its nose ring, and you might be able to tug, but unless he wants to walk, guess what? He's not going to walk. But this restoration, this saving work from death, happens by the atonement of God. Guys, I want to help you out here with something. You can't save anybody. But we can be a pointer to Christ. Now, in this, if you uh, uh, let him know, we find that that means that by this confrontation of those wandering from the faith, in, uh, instead of living the faith, How many people do we know that they're part of the faith, but yet they're wondering instead of living it? They know it, but yet they don't do it. believe James said something about that in chapter 4, verse 17. For those who know it the good good and do it not to them, it is sin. In this, we find a living faith means that we're not confirming what they're doing. You can look all around us today in this society. I, I tell you, uh, 30 years ago, I never thought we would be in the moral state that we are. Too many times we confirm sin instead of condemning sin. it will be okay. no. God, sin is sin, no matter what it is. But in this, uh, this going to them and having them know the sin, having them know their error, uh, as it will save their soul from death, uh, we find in that simply it's by converting him away from his sin. And what that does is it really, it, it turns us to have some assurance. I think to Romans 8, 1, uh, where he says, For those that are in him, there is no condemnation. To be in Christ means we are not answering for the judgment that we deserve. But here's a question. If that is true, then the converse is also true. I like that math there, didn't you? If we are in Christ, there is no condemnation. But the converse is also true. If we are not in Christ, there is nothing but judgment for us. The word save there is the word sozo. It means to deliver, to bring out. Soul is the word psyche. We've talked about that. But as we look at this word death, this is one that that really we scratch our heads about a little bit. Uh, this word is uh, thanatos. It's probably where Marvel got the word thanos. Thanatos. And it does mean a bodily death. You mean, preacher, if I get out and sin and I become a stumbling block to somebody that, get, that, that, that needs to get saved, that, that you can take me out, that answer is? Yes. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine, and he had a, uh, a young Christian in his, in his church. This person had been in the midst of drugs. They had uh, been in a very lascivious lifestyle. They get saved. They get clean. They're doing good. And then they backslide, and they take just a little bit too much. And the next day they find them out in their front yard dead. It can happen. 
This word uh, thanatos means to be, have a separation from God. Now, that does not mean that you lose your relationship. That means you lose the fellowship. How many times have we ever uh, prayed unto God and it seemed like all we could do was pray to the, uh, and all we heard was an echo from the ceiling. And we knew that it didn't go anywhere. But this, this thanatos also means to be in misery for sin. You show me a true Christian, a child of God that gets in sin, there is misery as God is convicting them of that sin. Look at the rest of this verse and we will be done with the book of James. From death Okay, and cover a multitude of sins. To cover, kalepo. Multitude is pleathos. And the word sins there, I'm not even going to try to say. But how, how does this, these multitudes of sins get covered? Well, first, they are covered by the love of Christ. I believe there was a man that one once said, No greater love does a man have than this, that he would die for his friends. How much love is it that Christ had for you, that he died for you? And if he had that love for you, how much does he have for them? It's a love that forgives. If you remember on the, the cross, we, we find uh, that he died on the cross. But if you remember, as he's, he's on the cross, he cries out to the Father and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what, know what they do. The love that forgives. I'm afraid that a lot of times we don't have that love. It's a love that lives in the finished work of Christ. On the cross, right after that, Christ says, I thirst, and they, of course, they give him the, the vinegar, and then he says, Totalistai. It is everything that needed to be done for their restoration, for your restoration, was done to cover your sin. It was covered by the blood of Christ. I was talking with uh, Brother Tim earlier today, and we were, we were talking about uh, this, uh, the very fact of propitiation. Christ was your propitiation for your sin. Not a propitiation, but the propitiation. His blood uh, was shed to cover your sins, to give you mercy, to give you the grace to seal you into the day of redemption. Then I'm going to go over real fast, and we will be done. I, uh, in uh, Psalm 32, we're going to look at verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered. See, when, I, when uh, our covering of, is done by this multitude of sins, we find that we are blessed. Preacher, I don't feel blessed tonight. You are. You're blessed beyond measure. Because the God that said, let there be light and there was light, loved you enough to make it where you could be with him forever.
in this covering, we find David is saying that we are forgiven. Tonight, let me ask you a question. Where do you need that love? Where do you need that forgiveness? And then let me ask you this. Where do you need to show and give that love? Where do you need to show and give that forgiveness? Because as David said, whose sin is Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious, Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now. Father, I just want to praise your name. Father, as we've went through this book of James, I... Father, I'm astounded by your love. Help us to have taken this last bit. And Father, maybe if it's us that's wondering... Father, make someone come to help us. But Father, those that we know that are wondering, Father, I just simply ask that you would give us an unction to bring them back. For it's your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. All right. A real quick question.